This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and Discord servers, on-screen shoutouts, and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. The Browns are at an interesting place, right? And it has to do a lot with where they're at when it comes to the salary cap. And the salary cap is one of those things where it's really easy to have an opinion that's based in misinformation because the salary cap is very complex. There's a lot of different ways to work around it. And it's essentially like an accounting ledger, right? Like it's not this hard thing that it appears to be. Um, it can be moved around. So to talk about the Browns salary cap and to figure out like what the Browns issues might be, what we should anticipate for this team going forward. Um, and what isn't really the issue that it appears to be. Um, Jack Duffin is on. Jack, it's been a while, man. How you been? Good. I hate since we spoke. Uh, what well, I got married. I've been honeymoon. It's, it's it's been a busy time. <laughs> but uh, hey, I've noticed you got an upgraded microphone. Your, your setup looks nice. And like you know, you know, I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. Uh, but Jack, it, it's it's been an interesting year for the Cleveland Browns. Obviously, two and seven is not where this team remotely wanted to be coming into the season. The performance from Deshaun Watson was not encouraging, to say the least. And now we're looking at somebody who is just came off a season where he had throwing shoulder surgery and now an Achilles surgery at 30 plus years old. Like, just let's try to take out all of the other factors with Deshaun Watson. Do you like knowing how Andrew Barry operates? Right. And I think you have a pretty good grasp on this. Do you feel like he is somebody who's going to look at that situation and say, hey, that's a player I want to go forward with, like just considering what's happened with that guy in the last six months and what will have to happen for that guy to come back, even if we're not considering the off the field stuff, the money stuff and everything else? No, I think it's about a managed exit now um, and, and with anything, if. As much as you can say, and it could be all three of them, Andrew Berry, Jimmy Haslam, and Kevin Stefanski were all in on making this move. If if you then go to your boss after two years of a five-year deal and then you go, hey, it's time to cut bait, we screwed up, That's a it's a dangerous position to be. Whereas you get to year three, suddenly you're over the halfway mark, and it's much easier to turn to your boss and go, hey, we're three years in, it didn't work, here's the managed exit out of that. And mm -hmm. I think that's one where people were so quick after, hey, he's played like 10 games for the team and yeah, it's time to give up and move on. It's like, that's a difficult thing to do when you've made this level of investment, whereas it always felt like year three was going to be make or break. It was the time that if it had gone well, we're sat here talking about an extension after year three. It's also the time that, hey, it's gone pretty much worse than anyone could have imagined it. Now's the point where you talk about what's the future and how's that working. Now, with the injury with Deshaun, right, there are some interesting mechanisms that, that come into play here with the salary cap. How does him having an Achilles tear um, impact his salary cap future for the Cleveland Browns? Um, and let's say he returns by the start of the season. How different is it if he returns at the start of the season versus like halfway through? In all honesty, it won't actually change that much of the money. So there's some insurance on him. The insurance stuff is all pretty shady in terms of the league. The league don't like talking about it. It's not out there in the public domain. But they'll they'll probably get a little bit of insurance money from last season. So well, this season. So the 2024 season, he's injured. What that number might be from like half a million to seven million. We don't really know that answer yet, but they're going to get something and that will impact the 2025 salary cap. So they'll get a credit. He really needs to miss sort of eight seasons next year for them to get any cap relief for the following year. And looking at injuries like this, I don't think you're going to miss eight games of the 2025 season. So I'd expect him to be back. So that long term picture, I don't think it's as realistic as some people were hoping. Mm -hmm. And when you say like insurance, because like it's a new concept to me, what what exactly is that? Like, how does that work with with injuries when you say like there's like going to be an insurance benefit there? 
Yeah, so the owners, well, it's owner's money, effectively, it's all owner's money. Um, mm. They can go get an insurance out and they can say, hey, we'll give you five million. And if Deshaun Watson gets injured, then you're going to give us this. But there's always certain rules around it. Hey, you need to miss so many games and stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't get the full details of oh, what okay. that is. But when you initially take the insurance out, it has no salary cap benefits. So it's not like you need to account for two million on there for this insurance you paid nothing only if he gets injured you then get a bit of cap money back that level of how much back it's, it's all a bit hush hush and it, if you get the actual printed version of a contract there's a, an amendment in there with it but it's not really in the public domain it's not like the salary cap numbers that OT, over the cap do a phenomenal job you can pull those up you can look at it but it's one that it costs nothing in terms of the salary cap to take out insurance and then only if it that player gets injured you gain anything so a team like the the bengals and the raiders don't have money to lob up loads of insurance policies whereas the eagles and the browns cash rich owners they can play around in the insurance market a lot more and who do where do you get these like do you get these policies with like the nfl or are they just like inside the the individual players contract negotiated with the agent yeah so the collective bargaining agreement allowed for them mm -hmm. um and then it's one that ESPN did an article probably about two, three weeks ago. Um, and then what else? Um, Joel Corey, who's a former agent, did a, a piece on it, um, which is worth a read. But there's there's very, very little of it out there in the public domain. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the issue that it's it's easy for me to work out with sites like Overcap. Oh, here's what's going on. I can explain that. Whereas yes. when it's all a bit hush-hush, it's, it's tough to know. There's about half the teams are currently using them about 75 percent of the teams have used them at some point so they're getting used most teams will only bother doing it with a quarterback but it's a tough one to know all right so speaking of watson there, there's a situation here where he's not in my opinion i don't think they're gonna roll into the season guaranteeing him the starting job like i think there's gonna be some kind of like justin fields russell wilson type competition here where he might have the edge to start but there's going to be a bit of a competition to come into next season, depending on when he's going to come back from that Achilles injury and when he's going to be marked back. Cause you got to prepare somebody to be the starter all off season. Um, how, what do you think the Browns budget is at quarterback? If they want to bring in a veteran guy to maybe bridge over this year um, at the quarterback position, given that it's already going to be expensive, uh, given it to Sean Watson. Is it already expensive? Yeah, I, I don't reckon there's that much of a budget restraint here because, in all honesty, hmm. say you signed a, a player, let's say 50 million, you're, that 50 million is going to be in a signing bonus. So it's only actually 10 million of it lands on the 2025 salary cap. So they're not too hamstrung in that aspect of what they can spend. The bigger issue is there's just not quarterbacks you want to pay much money to that hit the market free agency um, and that's kind of the challenge if you were going to get Dak Prescott and stuff walking around each year hitting the market then that's a that's a challenging contract who knows it could be 60 million you would feasibly be able to do it but Dak Prescott level talent doesn't hit free agency you're talking about Jameis Winston's in the upper echelons of that I think one name that I continue to come back for and I think would make a lot of sense is Kirk Cousins Kirk Cousins mm -hmm. is due 27.5 million next year you could take that on and then you you turn that into a sign Money bonus, you're talking about what six million off the top of my head, um, roughly. That's a mm -hmm. easily manageable number on the 2025 salary cap. I, I remain that if they don't win a playoff game, I think they're at the point of saying, Well, is he the guy we want to keep long term? We're, we've just spent this first round pick on Michael Penix. Um, do we want to commit to Kirk Cousins or do we go? Kirk Cousins was good enough to get us to the playoffs, but, but we saw it with the Browns last year just because Joe Flacco got the Browns through those last few games into the playoffs. You weren't like, hey, Joe Flacco's the future of my franchise. So Kirk Cousins would be a phenomenal option. Gives you two years where you can go, look, we might not draft someone in 2015. He can be a bridge for us in 2020, uh, 2025. Bridge in 2026 and you can phase into a, a first round pick that you take in a, a year's time in that draft. So he gives you better options. I think Jameis Winston level talent is just not good enough unless mm -hmm. you know you're going to draft after quarterback 
and the Browns probably finish somewhere in the five to eight range where they pick, that you're not in a position where you're number one and you're like, hey, we're taking the quarterback. It, it's easy. Life's easy when you pick number one and you've got a quarterback, a Joe Burrow, a, um, a Williams, someone that you're like, hey, we're definitely taking this guy. It's a lot more difficult when you're a handful of picks back. Okay. So you think this is something they could still do even if like why like barring there's no Watson suspension or anything that kind of relieves you of his future cap stuff, you think that still getting Kirk Cousins is possible? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um and I think Kirk Cousins has got history with um Kim Svansky that helps. It's a talent it's a roster that is known for having a lot of talent. Um and that that showed at the trade deadline because all these names people mm -hmm. are the Browns roster sucks, but here's all these guys that we want loads of picks for. We've got to trade them away. And it's like, well, you, you told me the roster sucked and it's got no one everyone wants, but suddenly you, you put these seven, eight players that mm -hmm. um, are going for decent picks. So it's one that they can go out and afford who they want to afford. They'll be able to afford anyone that's realistically on the market at quarterback. That's interesting. It's interesting. Um, basically, I, the thing with the Watson contract is like how do they manage it for the rest of the time being like is this going to be something to where they just kind of like what is the best case going forward is the best case cutting him in a certain year or is it letting this thing kind of play out financially and like just kind of like restructure 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 and like could you explain if that is the case how that would work yeah the the dream scenario of finance wise is he gets suspended because then mm -hmm. that's not he's due another 92 million so 46 million for next season and 46 million for the year after if he got a suspension they would be able to avoid those guarantees and they can they probably wouldn't cut him now they would cut him on the the first day of the league year in march um just because then you can split that over two years but let, let's put the suspension and dream scenario to a side how you deal with that if he's not suspended is you restructure his contract in the new league year. And that'll probably happen really early on in the new league year. And then they'll restructure his contract again, right at the start. We're talking March 2026. And then probably the following day, a post-June 1st cut. And what that does with the remaining numbers is you have 37 million in 2025. You have 46 million in 2026. And then you have 89 and a half million in 2027. And that 89 million might seem like quite a lot, but the difference between now and then is the salary cap's like 70, 80 million bigger than it is now. So mm. you've got three years to prepare for it. The salary cap's going to significantly increase. And it doesn't, people are like, oh yeah, but then you won't be able to sign anyone in 2027. That's just nonsense. Because what happens in 2027 is all the guys you're signing are in backloaded deals and you might sign... 200 million of talent if you put them as signing bonuses well that's only going to cost you 40 million on the cap so you just backload it all out and that was probably part of the picture of when they signed him they thought hey this is what we'll do for all six years that he's going to account on the books five years and then that year there uh, was that he doesn't work out not he's this bad it's like he's a baker mayfield level talent that's that kind of mid-tier where you're like look we don't want to time to the future but he's not bad enough um, and that was probably the the realistic middle of the road scenario where they went we'll restructure all five years and then we can allow him to walk it's 89 and a half million but we know that's coming so i'm not too worried for the cap i'd rather have another 92 million to play with over the mm -hmm. next uh, two years of cash but it is what it is yeah and that's the interesting thing that i find about the brown salary cap situation because as much as I've heard nationally about people panicking about the Brown salary cap situation, they've been able to keep their players, right? Like they're, they're clearly planning on keeping David and Joku, Miles Garrett, um, who probably get extension that to your point, right? They'll he'll get the extension this off season more than likely, but it won't really hit to like 2027, 20, 28, 29. And they did a really good job with this contract this year. Well, the last time around. So, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting to see like what people are saying was going to happen with the salary cap versus like what the reality is. Like people told me you couldn't keep JOK, you can't keep Grant Delpit. Like this is going to cost you your young guys, but these young guys are kept past the window that you expect Deshaun Watson to be the starter now. Um, and it's it's 
why do you think that this level of, of misinformation just doesn't get corrected? Because even though that has happened, right, we've watched the Browns be able to keep their young players. People still act like that's going to make us trade Miles Garrett um, during the trade deadline when it's been clear that that's not been the case with how this team operates. Like, what what do you think can be done to to get the to make the message, not the messaging, but to kind of make sure that people have a better idea of, of like what is really going to hurt the salary cap, how it works and, and all of that. Yeah, and it, it's tough because if you cover another team and you think, hey, here's the headline Browns numbers. Yeah, that, that sucks. Mm -hmm. That's not a great place to be. But then it's understanding that the Browns are doing things slightly different in the same way that the... The Raiders and Bucks used to do something different. Of they would just pay cash meets cap, really low spenders, but they've always got quite a bit of cap space. And it's like, well, you just spend like 70, 80 million a year less than the Browns. So it's not an optimal way of managing your team and managing your roster. So I don't think you're ever going to stop the misinformation. Um, I think once the Browns get through this process, people will be like, oh, they're doing something different. It's like, yeah. It's what I've been telling you for ages. And the one thing they can't do, and it probably causes some frustration of people, they can't blow it up. And mm -hmm. for me, you wouldn't blow it up because there's so much talent already on the team that, yeah, it's not delivering. But that doesn't mean the talent's not there. And someone like Cedric Tillman was a bust three weeks ago. And now <laughs> people are like, oh, he's he's a baller. And it's Isaiah Maguire. I was yeah. inactive for the first year. What well, wasted pick, sack Andrew Berry. And then it's like, oh, actually, Isaiah Maguire is really, really good. And it's like, yeah, judge these things in like year three of the player. You can't judge mm -hmm. that stuff. What do they do in the rookie year? Because the Browns don't draft rookies to start. The Browns draft rookies as depth and development players because they've gone out in free agency because of the extra money Jimmy has some spending, the system that Dee Podesta and Andrew Berry have created of contract management. They can be a lot more talent in there. there. There's an extra sort of three, four, five, ten million plus players that has an impact on sort of how much your rookies play. So it's a difficult dynamic. They don't have the ability to blow it up. Some people are like, yeah, get rid of Miles Garrett, get rid of Inchoku, get rid of Tomlinson, get rid of all these players, and we'll start from the ground up and have like a two year rebuild. They don't have that ability because they are invested on keeping the the core together and that's perfectly fine for me i don't want to get rid of the core i don't want to get rid of miles mm -hmm. garrett i don't want to get rid of all these guys because i i think they can compete in the playoffs if my if they somehow manage to get kirk cousins traded to the team and say that costs the amari cooper third round pick fine you're making the playoffs next season and you realistically got a chance of winning playoff games and if that is the case, you don't blow this up. You blow it up if you're sucking like the Saints and the Raiders and bits like that. But Browns aren't there. So, yeah, the Browns are in a good spot. Um, there's no way to stop the myths. But I will panic when certain stuff happens. I'm not in a position where I'm panicking anything about where they are financially. All right. Uh, before we get some more specifics about the salary cap and the draft coming up, I did want to ask um, a question about the offensive line if that's okay this offensive line like I, I i've been making the point for a little while here it's like they, they've just been living like not living off the 2020 reputation but they've been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years right like the line wasn't super great in 2022 it was still pretty good then in 2023 there was a significant fall off there from a lot of the like not just like you know jed wills but Joe Batonio, right? Like Wyatt Teller, um, guys that you really rely on to, to play good football for you. The Browns have an interesting situation here where they're playing DeWan Jones at left tackle. They have drafted Zach Center. Now, I wanted them to get a tackle in last year's draft. I'll be clear about that. But I do acknowledge if DeWan Jones works out at left tackle, all of a sudden, that changes the entire way you view this offensive line because now you can look at DeWan being at left tackle, um, possibly Zach Center being able to fill in for Joe Batonio, who I think he's likely to retire sooner than later. Also, a quick question. We'll just side rail to that. If he, like, do you expect him to retire this year? And also, if he does, how does that affect the salary cap? Yeah, so I've said for a few years I thought this would be Joel Batonio's final year. And that's not from my... I'm not an insider. 
that mm -hmm. there's people at the OBR that I write with that are insiders and they get that stuff. I just shoot off my gut and all of my coverage is like, hey, I'd, this just is like the logical thing and where you see it going. And as soon as they drafted Zinter, that kind of like rubber stamped of like, I think my gut's right. You're not using a third round pick on a guard if you think Joel Batonio is going to play an extra three years. So I think he retires. And what they would do is they would sign him to a new contract um, which would bring his base salary down to like a minimum uh, like 1.2 million for this year. And then they won't officially retire him until the 2nd of June. And the reason for that is just cap wise, it just allows them to spread his retirement over two years. Um, so that's what the process would be. And in all honesty, carrying him on one of your 90 man rosters till the 2nd of June is not going to matter. Um in the grand scheme bit where it's just split that dead cap over two years it makes everything so much smoother okay yeah i was always wondering like how does that work out there especially when there's a lot of uh time left on that deal um the rest of the offensive line like you look at wyatt teller you look at jack conklin do you think the browns will go in trying to find a completely new option like let's say we live in this world where dewan works at left tackle do you think they try to find a new option at right tackle or do you think they consider maybe Jed Wills as a value option there at right tackle, given that's his natural position? Like, how, how do you think what would be the economical path for them and like the best balance of like what's good for this team and also what's good for uh, the situation going forward? Because the offense line been really expensive for a long time and I think they really need to cut costs there. Yeah, so luckily the only super expensive position in free agency is left tackle the other mm -hmm. four are just not that expensive to get average we're not talking elite but in all honesty like pff and other companies have done great studies that said you just want just above average because you can get elite offensive line but you have to pay through the nose for it and if one out of the five make a mistake it doesn't matter the offensive line is not going to work you need all five mm -hmm perfect every snap to be really really good so aim for above average um best use of resources for that position room so you can replace all of them let's say batonio retires so go out and spend on a, a left guard go out and spend on a new center we're talking like hey it's 10 million on a left guard it's 5 million on a center is joel batonio is going to make more than that as one person they're going to put that into two so it's a saving Right guard, I'm intrigued to see how Teller does for the remainder of the season because I can see him staying around. I could see an extension there where you actually will keep him as a piece. And then Jack Conklin is one that I could see him staying around. Um, it will depend. If he's healthy for the rest of the season and he's playing like a sort of the eighth best back in the league, I think you're going to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably not going to pay him the 15 million, but you might say, hey, look, we'll guarantee you 10 million of it there'll be 5 million in incentives if you're healthy you can earn it or if you're not then hey we we save a bit of money and come to some form of deal on that the jed wills to right tackle i don't see it unless it happens in season so mm. if you see jack conklin go down and injured again and we get a four, six game sample of Jed Wills at right tackle. I think you can reasonably have that conversation of going, well, actually, he's done it really well. We'll keep him around. I don't think you go into free agency next year and you go, we're going to re sign him to be the right tackle because mm -hmm. they've not practiced it. They've not, you, if you're making that kind of financial commitment, you want to see it before you spend it. Um, so that's the direction they go. But one thing I would say in defense of Jed Wills is we've seen lots of these players, even take Joel Batonio. Joel Batonio with Deshaun Watson, the quarterback, was not playing like his old self. Joel Batonio with Flacco, with Winston, looked an awful lot better. So I think there's a fair argument to see Jed Wills never got the shot to play with Flacco, never really got the shot to play with um, Winston. Do you see a four, six game scenario? And then people are like, oh, Jed Wills is playing much better now. It's like, well, are we comparing him with a level playing field as everyone else? So it's, it's a dynamic. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, he could play better, but if he's a league average tackle, it's it's not bad. All right, let's work back to the draft here. The Browns right now have the number four overall pick. We kind of talked about this earlier with like the Browns' ability to still bring in guys this off season, despite like the salary cap situation um, not looking like 
that would be the case for them. Um, with the draft picks coming into the year, like just explain to us, are those draft picks already kind of accounted for when it comes to your salary cap space? Like how do you add that in? Because the difference between not drafting in the first round and then drafting in the top five from a money perspective, from what those guys are making a year is significant. Yeah, so in terms of sort of the numbers, they're, they're not there. I don't have them factored in. But what I'm going to do, I'm doing an article on Monday. Uh, I'm not sure when this is going out, but on Monday, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to dig through and just go, here's the salary cap position for next year. Let's throw the draft picks as it currently stands in there. Throw this stuff on and we'll come up with an exact number of, well, where are they financially? Um, it costs a lot. So if we take just, I've got, what is it, the fourth pick? Let's look at the fourth pick here. So that player would get a 23.3 million signing bonus, but that's not all on that one part. That would roughly work out 6.6 .6 million of cap space. So it's not a mm. it's not a crazy amount of money. Um, but if you take 6.6 .6 for the fourth pick, let's say if you win the Super Bowl and you're um, right at the bottom, that first round pick has a first year cap number of 2.3 million because they're getting a signing bonus of 6 million. So it's a significant sum if you're getting drafted top of the first round and bottom of the first round. That player is making a uh, a hefty sum less money. Mm -hmm. Talk about three 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 times the amount over the four-year deal between 32nd and 4th. So it might be one where they potentially trade back and it's not just a hey we traded back five spots and we added a, an extra pick in next year's first round, which that's beneficial to doing this its own right. Because if you're not drafting a quarterback this year, you may as well have two swings at it. Um, because if you, have, you're more likely to hit and find one great player with the eighth pick this year and the top 10 pick next year than you are with the fourth pick this year. Just pure luck and chance says that. And then you're also going to pay them an awful lot less money. So I think you're either drafting a quarterback or certainly lean towards trading down. But also with draft picks, they will go into free agency and they will get a starting 22. They are not drafting starters. Lots of people are talking about oh, which starter are they going to get a position. They will have a guy in free agency that comes in and does it. Ideally, yeah, if you're drafting someone in the fourth round, you want some route to them to come forward mm -hmm. and be there but it might be like Isaiah Maguire is great for the rest of the season and then they go oh we'll draft another edge really high because they like someone and you might go hey Miles Garrett, Isaiah Maguire this, this rookie Alex and that rookie Wright might too. start off 20% and then they might get up to like hey you're going to play 60% of snaps but that rookie will walk into a starting job Just it's the way Andrew Berry is going to build his roster he's going to bring in good players in free agency yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the city reacts to like the team having a first round pick again, because like I get messages every day about why Jamari Thrash isn't on the field, right? Like, and I'm like, well, he's just not going to be on the field that much. He he's behind Elijah Moore. This is, isn't his time to play. I mean, you had to trade Amari Cooper to give Cedric Tillman time, and like, and it looks like the strategy worked. Like when it comes to waiting for these guys to be in the right situation before you give them a big chance because Isaiah Maguire looks di way different this year than he looked last year um in limited time and then you can say same for Mari Cooper and I think you know when you look at the Browns and the moves that they've made I I don't get those moves being panned as much as they've been panned in my opinion because I think getting a third round pick for what was a fifth and seventh round pick swap for Amari Cooper. You look at the compensation that went out for other wide receivers. I mean, that's really good comp um, for Amari Cooper. And because with DeAndre Hopkins went for like a fifth or something like that, right? Um, and then getting a, like, I, I wouldn't call it amazing trade comp for Zadarius Smith. But I would say you made your money back. On, on that move right like you know you got you gave up a fifth to go get him you got your fifth back basically like you got your money back there but the Amari Cooper deal I think was really good considering that you haven't really missed him as much as people anticipated missing him and obviously at two and seven it wouldn't even matter if you're missing him that much um it just makes you feel more secure about the future of this team that Cedric Tillman is playing really good football right now um 
just on Amari Cooper, I think we'd have both been happy if they'd have come out in the off season and said, hey, we've extended Amari Cooper, 25 million a year, we've given him three extra years. First mm-hmm. two are guaranteed, and I'd have been like, that's cool. Amari Cooper has looked to shadow himself this season. Yeah, his first catch in Buffalo Bills was a touchdown, but it wouldn't surprise me by the end of the year, no one's offering Amari Cooper 25 million, where we'd have been cool with that. Um, but it's one that we, it's tough to know. And it's it's one of the things the Patriots used to do. They used to be slammed all the time for, oh, they sold early on this guy. And then a year later, everyone was like, oh, Bill Belichick obviously knew something. And it's that Amari Cooper's not performed to the level we assumed Amari Cooper was going to go to. But by not paying that 25 million a year extension, they might go into free agency next year and look, hey, T Higgins is on the market. 25, 27 and a half. Who knows what he might go for? But they might go... Actually, we're going to take a swing on that. And they've potentially upgraded and added a third round pick. So it's tough to know with these older players when you're the GM, you've got to make a decision because you're not paying Amari Cooper for what he's done in the past. You'd be Mm -hmm. paying Amari Cooper for what he's going to do in the next two, three years. And so some of the things about the salary cap I do think confuses people. Rollover cap, I think, is one of those things that confuses folk on how it works because I get messages all the time about why do the Browns have 40 something million dollars of cap space this year? They're not going to spend it. What even happens to that money? Um, Could you explain not only how rollover cap like basically works, but also how the Browns like to use rollover cap to their advantage and why they, they do it the way that they do it. Yeah, so they're sat with 46 uh, million of rollover cap at the minute. And once we get to the end of the year, it'd be the same way as imagine you get to the 31st of December. If you've got 46 million sat in your bank account, you'd be a happy person. Um, Mm -hmm. But the next day, that 46 million just lands straight onto your balance sheet for next year. So you roll it all over. It doesn't matter how much it is, you keep hold of it. But what they're effectively doing, rather than kind of... Miles Garrett say he's on 25 million a year they're not accounting on the book and going hey we're going to pay the 25 million this year on our balance sheet what we're going to do is because we're committed to Miles Garrett he's going to be a long term let's take that 25 million and we'll put 5 million in this year 5 million in next year and you can split the stuff up to 5 years in total so 4 years into the future and what they're effectively doing is splitting all those payments out the player gets the money straight away so it makes no difference to them but they're saying the salary cap's going up. So let's spread this payment terms out on the financial ledger. The financial ledger is the salary cap. It's the accounting mechanism. It's for accountants. It's not the real money is getting given to Miles Garrett at that point. But then what they're doing that across the entire roster is because they're spreading the payments out into the future, the salary cap goes up. They're spending about 50 million a year more than league average. And that's there to generate a better roster. There is talent on this roster. Has it performed this year? No. But then we can compare that to last year. Most teams that lose their starting quarterback end up with like the top five pick. They struggle. They suck. The Browns lost their starting quarterback. They had five different quarterbacks started and they landed in the playoffs. That's mm-hmm. because their roster is significantly better than everyone else. 50 million of talent out of the roster. Well, Amari Cooper, let's say that's 20. So Darius Smith, that's 15. Where should we find the other 15? Dalvin Tomlinson. That roster last year with no Cooper, no Tomlinson and no um, Zadera Smith would not have been in the playoffs. And that's that's what they're doing. They're going, because we're going to spread this money out over several years, we're going to spend more than everyone else. It's a balanced approach. And there is a, there is a tipping point. If they went, oh, let's just spend an extra 20 million more than we're doing now, you get to the point where it falls over. And there is a risk. There's another black swan event like the pandemic. The Browns are screwed. But it needs mm-hmm. to be that level of the salary cap, rather than going up roughly 8% a year, it drops 15%. That's very, very unlikely to happen. But if it does happen, yeah, it's, it's going to be grim. Yeah, I think if the salary cap's in another situation to drop, we're going to have bigger things to worry about than the Browns, like salary cap situation, to be honest. Given like how much it took for it to drop the last time it did. And it's not like so it's not like something where it's like, oh, if it doesn't increase at the rate that we expect it, we're screwed. It has to be something where it drops significantly, right? Yeah, if it goes up seven rather than eight percent, so be it. Um it's fine. It's slightly less money we'll spend in the season ahead, but 
whatever it's when it drops significantly mm. and the salary cap just always goes up because the tv deal that they signed over i think it was a 10-year tv deal that's factored in to increase so the tv deal doesn't all land in the first year of the deal they factor it to go up just because it's easier for everything to account and the tv companies don't it, the deal don't get signed and the tv company transfers like millions and millions straight into the nfl bank account it's on a payment plan these things are spread out so um yeah okay and i that's interesting to me too because i think even somebody like me who's been trying to message on this a little bit more accurately i tend to be like okay well as long as Saturday cap goes up they're fine it's really just as long as it doesn't go down right which is much more secure when you think about it uh because if people are like oh well, what if it doesn't increase the 10 percent or whatever you're anticipating it's like no they're not they're not like so tight on the on the numbers that it has to go up like eight ten percent every year it's just about making sure that there's consistent growth in the cap which is a pretty safe bet with where the nfl is right now yeah and the cap's tied to league earnings so if the league's not making more money they're sacking roger goodell and what they're doing mm -hmm. they're extending roger goodell because roger goodell makes lots more money so they're not slowing down any of this stuff um if if the league wasn't doing well and no one's watching the nfl then yeah the cap's gonna stagnate the cap's gonna continue going through the roof and the number next year might be a lot higher than expected because the league's not been transparent with how they've dealt with the covid um, reductions in cap we're hoping that this might be the year and last year was definitely a bigger increase but if they cleared all of that extra money so rather than it crash one year it mm -hmm. dropped a bit but they split that cost over sort of five years once that money's gone and cleared the cap will then increase at a quicker level as well so we're expecting it to rise i thought it'd be 27 and a half over the cap saying 20 seven two point five so they're two and a half million less per team but that's a semantics number it doesn't make that much of a difference there's going to be plenty of money there to pay people all right jack well thank you for coming on here anything else you you want to say before we head out man i don't think there's too much um i think they're in a good spot um but by all means let let's dig in on monday and uh <laughs> i have i honestly haven't sat there and really to the numbers to the extent where i'm going to do that on monday and that's going to be a fascinating read because i i when i write some of these articles i'm not like oh i've researched it i'm going to write on it i'm like let's research and write on it now so next monday i'm going to dig in um and let's present the picture exactly what it is um where we are based on draft picks and what does that financial impact on the team look like but they're in a good position does sean watson will get restructured there's plenty of money there and they can talk about which players they want to keep around, which ones they want to move on. Yeah. So make sure you guys keep your eyes out for that article on Monday coming out on the Browns or Orange Brown Report. Um, make sure you check it out. I do stuff on the YouTube channel for them as well. Um, always great talking to you, Jack. Make sure you guys check that out. Y'all have a great day. Have a better night. Peace. <laughs>